only one call away I'll be there to save the day Superman got nothing on me I'm only one call away God, he's taking his time It's been months now since he left God, I need something to occupy me I know I could go into his room. <laughs> oh, good grief. It's pretty dark. Now, where's the light? Oh, 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 oh shit! Ah. Oh, good grief. Oh, 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 oh. Good grief. Oh dear. Must replace that vase before he gets back. Ha! Ah, what a great opportunity this is. I wonder what that box is for. Hmm. Yes, I mean, maybe there's some information here on why the hell he's in Yui in the first place. Yes! <laughs> Hang on. Oh! Oh, what's that awful smell? <coughs> oh, oh no! Oh, this is horrible! Oh, I'm getting out of here! Oh. <coughs> oh, hello everyone! Yes, it's the second instalment in the Parasite Biology series. Now, last time, we talked about all the sneaky tactics that parasites use to facilitate transmission. Yeah? Now today, we're going to be talking about host and parasite populations. We're going to look and be looking more into the ecology of parasites, if you like. So, let's talk about hosts then. A host is a discrete resource, yeah? And each host, even if you're a parasite which, uh, you know, only infects one species, let's say, each host is different. They vary in age, sex, size, all loads of different things. Now obviously within the population of hosts, not all will be infected by a particular parasite, yeah? And this is where prevalence comes in. That's a measure of the proportion of the population which are infected, right? But of course, different members of the population, of the host population, could have different intensities of infection. When we're diagnosing the extent of a parasitic infection, we can measure it using direct and indirect methods, okay? So direct methods are these fecks. No, that isn't Mrs. Brown talking. Fecal egg counts is what we're talking about. And this is the case for many worms, like tapeworms, where you'll find, you know, eggs in the feces. Um, you'll poo them out, so it's proglotted. Because remember, tapeworms are basically big sex machines. They come made up of little segments called proglottids where male and female reproductive organs are. Okay, and they can just fall off the animal and be released in your poo. Okay? Also, you can also count the number of eggs in the urine. In the case of schistosomiasis, which we talked about last time, yeah? Schistosoma hematobium, more specifically. Yeah? You can also take skin samples in the case of some filet, filarial nematodes, so the Onchocerca volvulus and the Wuscheraria and the Brugia that we talked about last time. Um, blood smears, obvious one being malaria, for example, but also um, for looking for trypanosomes, so sleeping sickness, you know, very important diseases. There are protozoan infections which you can detect by looking at the faeces. Giardia is one of them as well. But what about the indirect ways of measuring um, the extent of infection? Well, we can look for symptoms of disease, yeah? And how bad those symptoms are that you've got will give us some sort of a measure on the intensity of the infection, yeah? Also, there's ELISA, which is enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. I think that's right. Hang on. Hey! Yes it is! Hey! And this is a technique which measures the abundance of the amount of antibodies in your system, okay? Although, if they can't be completely trusted, because that, the amount of antibodies you have in you 
may have something to do with a previous infection that you've had. So using these methods, it's difficult to distinguish between prior and current infections, right? Now, there's an important point to make here, very important point, and it's the point that the number of infected individuals doesn't necessarily equal the number of individuals with the disease. For many, you know, parasitic diseases, it takes a certain number of parasites within you to actually result in any symptoms. Okay, so you could be infected with some parasite, but not actually feel any symptoms, any effects from that, okay? Because the abundance of the parasite within you is too small. Right, now there's some words that we've got to get right here. We've talked about what prevalence is. I've also said abundance and intensity quite a lot. Now, what do I mean and what's the difference? Okay, they're very distinct. Abundance is the number of parasites within a host population. It's the average number of parasites within the host population. And that's including hosts which aren't infected. Okay? Intensity, on the other hand, is something different. It's among the infected hosts, what is the average number of parasites? Okay? So they're quite different. Then, we've also got another word, which is incidence. Which is the number of new cases of disease or infection that appear in a population in a given period and it's expressed as a percentage of the population size at time zero. So given what the population size was when t equals zero, it is the number of infected individuals you got within that period, okay? So between now and the start point, okay? So there's some nice quirky definitions for you. Now, the World Health Organization, the WHO, have released what are called DALIs, which are Disability Adjusted Life Years. And these give an indication on how the health of an individual, a host, um, can be affected by a given parasite. And what's interesting is that years lost to disability every year is greater in helminths than it is the malaria parasite. Which seems a bit weird, because I told you yesterday how the malaria parasite is probably the deadliest organism on the planet. And that's true. But helminths are so widespread, it means much more people will be affected by helminths. Now, the way you measure your parasite populations depends on what parasite we're dealing with. Now, something I didn't go into quite as much detail last time was the difference between micro and macro parasites. Now, you may think, well, they basically speak for themselves. Micro small, macro big, right? There are other subtle differences, though. Micro parasites are able to reproduce within the host. Okay, so I don't know, like the malaria parasite, for example, goes inside our red blood cells, carries on dividing, reproducing, creating loads, millions of malaria parasite cells within us, which could potentially kill us, right? Macro parasites, however, these are usually the helminths, the worms, and the amount you have in your body is representative of the amount you took in. Okay, so, for example, if you ingested a tapeworm, if you ingested two tapeworms, then you'll stick with two tapeworms. They won't multiply inside you. They'll reproduce, eggs will release in your poo, and then they'll carry on their life cycle. So when relating it to prevalence, intensity, and abundance, for microparasites, we can use prevalence, because that's all about how many hosts are infected. But we can't really uh, measure intensity or abundance, because that would involve actively counting the number of individual parasites within each host, which, for something as small as a protozoan, is impossible. And even if we were able to, this wouldn't give any indication on the number of infective events that had occurred, okay? Now, when you're looking at the distribution of the intensity um, of parasites within a host, you'll see that it follows an aggregated distribution, which, in other words, is a negative binomial distribution. And this is what I've drawn here on this graph. So on the x-axis, we've got the number of parasites per host, 
and on the y-axis we've got the frequency. And what you see is that most parasites are at lower intensities, lower densities within a host. Now when I say aggregated distribution, go a little bit of maths here, I mean an aggregated distribution doesn't have to be negative binomial. The key factor is that the variance has got to be greater than the mean. And that's the case here in this graph. Okay, if we look at distributions such as the Poisson distribution, that is where the variance equals the mean. So that isn't an aggregated distribution, that's a random distribution. Right? Anyway, back to the biology! This aggregated distribution idea of parasite populations was first put forward by Crofton and his mates. Right? And what's interesting is, if you look at this from the parasite's perspective, so the number of parasites per host and on the y-axis, we have the percentage of parasites at that abundance, yeah? then we see a completely different distribution. Because obviously, the greater the number of parasites per host, the greater the percentage of parasites there will be, right? So what we can see here is that most parasites are in low density settings, which you may think is a bit of a disadvantage, especially for dioecious species, that's basically non-hermaphrodites, one where there's a male and a female that need to get together and have a bit of rumpy pumpy. Obviously if there's less of you then there's a reduced chance of finding a mate. But why do we see this distribution? Let's try and explain it now. Now it could be down to the host. Hosts, different hosts, may have different susceptibilities. Now that could be genetic, and we're going to look into the idea specifically of wormy people later on. Um, so perhaps, you know, a host may be genetically more susceptible to being infected by a particular parasite than another individual, because we've talked about our hosts vary, you know, Every, each one of us are di is different, yeah? Or it could be due to occupational reasons. If you, I don't know, work in a sewer, you know, as a, or, you know, work on a rubbish tip or something, then you're probably going to be more susceptible to certain infections than you would be if you worked in a nice clean office, right? That's obvious. However, let's say all hosts are equal, and this doesn't have an effect, that means it must have something to do with the parasite distribution. If parasite populations have a clumped distribution, yeah, so it's not, you know, randomly distributed, they're in clumps, these populations, then that would also result in this aggregated distribution curve. So, going back to this idea of wormy people then, so this is all about the people with high intensity of infection of a particular parasite can reacquire that high intensity of reinfection. So, worms seem to prefer certain individuals than others, and this has been well studied now. Now, we must take into account things like children, for example, probably have greater exposure to certain parasites, you know, when they're playing about in the mud and whatever. But there is definitely a strong genetic basis to this, and specific chromosomal locations which could, you know, result in these wormy genes have been identified. Okay, we're going to zoom in more now on the actual hosts. What's the distribution of infection of hosts of different ages? And this is a phenomenon that we call peak shift. Okay, now, got a nice diagram on the board. On the x-axis we've got age, on the y-axis we've got prevalence of infection. And what you're seeing is that, apparently, the younger you are, the greater the prevalence of infection. Okay, that's what we're seeing. But we've got two different curves here. Now, this curve, which goes all the way up here and down, this is in a population where the transmission of a particular parasite is high, okay? Ignore lambda, I've got it as 0.4, that's just copied off a slide, okay? But 0.4 compared to 0.05 on this curve means that this one has a high transmission rate, whilst on the other hand, this curve here, which is a lot more flat, has a low transmission rate. So in high transmission zones, there's a greater proportion of younger individuals getting infected 
than in lower transmission zones. Now, why could that be? Now, various experiments have been done looking at populations of particularly the schistosomes again, those creatures which rely on snails for their transmission, their digenians. And what basically the idea is that if you have a high, if you're in an area of high transmission, then you develop immunity quicker. Yeah, so earlier on in your life. So by the time you're, you know, I don't know how old, but old, yeah, then it's easier to fight off infection. Whereas if the transmission is lower in a particular area, then there's less pressure, okay, to develop immunity, okay? Whilst if the transmission rate's high, then, well, then being parasitized is being a constant issue, so your body needs to develop in order for it to survive in that environment. Yeah? And a guy called Woolhouse did a whole load of mathematical modelling experiments trying to describe this. And he found that there's a negative correlation between peak prevalence, which of course in this curve is here and in this curve it's here, there's a negative correlation between peak prevalence and the age of peak prevalence. And that's pretty obvious because that's basically what we're seeing in this graph here. Now density dependent effects have a huge role in determining host population sizes, which they should do because you know, any ecologist you know, talks about density and density independent effects and the relative importance of each all the time. No difference in parasite ecology. Yeah? So, these density dependent effects include things like competition for resources, obviously classic ecology answer that is, I think, but also the immune response. Now, I'm going to do a whole, you know, load of videos on parasite immunology later in the series, but like Harry was saying earlier, sometimes it takes a certain number of parasites within you to generate that um, immune response. To and a study related to this was done by Steer et al, looking at nematode infection in sheep. You don't know exactly which species. Okay, and what, he counted um, faecal egg counts, yeah, and also he recorded the number of eggs per nematode. So what he plotted was, was the number of female worms on the x-axis, and then, let's say, the faecal egg count. Okay, so... As the number of female worms increase, obviously the number of eggs in the faeces increased. So it went up. But it wasn't a linear relationship. It sort of went up and plateaued off. It was an asymptotic curve. On the other hand, if we're looking at the number of eggs released per female, then remember, we've got the number of females on the x-axis within that sheep. Now here, the greater the number of females, the lower the number of eggs per worm released by a female. And this isn't linear, it goes down and curves off like that. Steer showed that if there were no density dependent effects at all, then we should see a linear correlation between the number of female nematodes and the faecal egg count or the number of eggs released per female. But we don't. So density dependent effects are having a big impact on parasite populations. So we've talked about all the things that control host parasite populations. We've discussed how important parasites are in ecosystems. Um, so little data from the World Health Organization. A quarter of the world's population has worms. That's a nice, nice thought. Mostly in the tropics, so sub-Saharan Africa and places where you know, hygiene isn't particularly great compared to, you know, usually developed countries like the UK. Now looking at a natural ecosystem, Curis et al. looked at three estuaries in Mexico, right? And he found that 1% of all animal biomass was parasites, which when you think about it, is quite a lot, yeah? In fact, the number of biomass of parasites was equal to the biomass of fish in that estuary, and it was greater than the biomass of birds, right? So, 
Parasites are extremely abundant in loads of different ecosystems, okay, and this provides a huge ecological force. A study in Carpinteria in California estimated that the average parasite biomass was equivalent to 7 to 10 elephants. Impressive figures. Okay, and on that thought, I'm going to leave you. Parasites are everywhere, you cannot escape them. Next time we're going to be talking about how parasites affect the host. Very exciting, but for the moment, toodle pip.